Hello. Welcome. It's good to see you all tonight. My name is Adam Jeff, and I'm the manager of Asia Pacific Design Library. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land and pay respects to their ancestors who came before them and to the elders still living today. The location of the State Library on Karupa Point was historically a significant meeting, gathering and sharing place for Aboriginal people. We proudly continue that tradition here today. Now I have a, a public service announcement. Um, I've just heard, and some of you might know, that the Forex Brewery is on fire. Um, now, there is a, obviously beer is an issue, but more importantly, I suspect that some of our other guests here are gonna be a little bit delayed. So um, we've got the door at the back of the auditorium open. So if somebody does come in stumbling around, just maybe make some room for them, that would be amazing. The fire is out now, but the roads are still closed. If you're heading home that way as well, maybe just consider going a different route than Milton Road. Other housekeeping issues, uh, toilets, level two, level three. In the case of an emergency, please head to the closest door. We'll assemble at Goma, um, which is just behind us down there. The phones in your pockets, in your hands, in your bags, please make sure they are on silent. We do have a hashtag that you can use tonight if you want to follow along and tweet Instagram um, or whatever other social media you have. The other thing I should mention on Instagram is at the end of the lecture tonight, we'll be announcing our first winner for um, Arky Spy. So we're really excited about that um, and we're excited to share with you the image that we think is fantastic from the last week. Um, for those of you who have friends or colleagues who couldn't get here tonight, we are live streaming right now and the video will also be up online in the next little while. Uh, both on designonline.org.au as well as through UQ Architecture right now, I think, on Facebook, as well as the uh, APDL Facebook. To get any information that you might need about your CPD points, there is uh, some information on Design Online, and you can also get that information on SLQ What's On page as well. It's my pleasure to pass over to Sandra Cargio grady Dean of Architecture and Head of School at the UQ School of Architecture to introduce tonight's event. Please welcome Sandra. So good evening and welcome. Tonight I'm stepping into the stepping in for series curator Kelly Greenop. She sends her apologies as she couldn't be here to welcome you all to the second lecture in our 2017 lecture series. Before I introduce Melissa, I'd like to briefly mention the school's social outreach studio. I think I meant to do this one. The Social Outreach Studio offers students the opportunity to travel to rural and remote communities and collaborate with organisations who are facing social or economic disadvantage. The studio aims to connect architecture students with communities where architects and design ideas are less common. Students learning in remote and regional areas are better equipped to meet future challenges and will be encouraged to work outside their comfort zone in their careers as architects. I'd like to encourage you all to donate online today. Just Google search for Social Outreach Studio UQ. We are planning uh, right at the moment a possible uh, Social Outreach Studio for second semester in Cairns. I'd also like to briefly mention that there is still a small number of tickets available for tomorrow night's Working in Asia event, which is hosted by Gaydon's Lawyers. The panel explores how working in Asia might open up new professional and personal opportunities, from working in the slums of India to boutique studios in Japan. The panelists, Anya Meng, Christina Cho, Carly Manane, Kirsty Simpson and Natasha Chi will discuss their motivations to work offshore and share their rich experiences. I've been speaking with the four of them over the last few weeks and they've got some very good stories to tell. So please register via Eventbrite. 
Now on to tonight's lecture. It's a real pleasure to have Melissa Lan Leandro here at Sutoris and Leandro in Indonesia. Melissa uh, grew up in Indonesia until about the age of 11 when her family relocated to Sydney. So her childhood was spent in Australia and Indonesia. She graduated with an interior design degree from UTS um, in Sydney and then after a few years working and travelling decided that she wanted to expand her opportunities and go back to study and to study architecture. So she did her uh, professional degree at TU Delft, worked in London and was it in Delft or London that you met your partner? At Delft. So at Delft she met uh, Laszlo Tsutoris and they set up practice in Indonesia about five years ago and the practices are already doing interesting things. So one of the especially um, strong reasons for me being happy that she's here is that we'd had a cancellation. I don't think she knows this, but we had someone else lined up for this spot who pulled out right at the last minute. And I was actually quite pleased because I had wanted to get Melissa out here for some time. So it gave me an opportunity to intervene in the curation of the uh, design series which I'm really not meant to do, but I did. So, she's my pick. I will take the blame and the credit. So, I'd now like to uh, welcome Melissa onto the stage. Um, thank you for uh, APAC and the School of Architecture for inviting me here uh, tonight. Um, uh, I'll, I'll show you a few of our projects, so hopefully I can share with you um, what we've learned and the surprises we have encountered while, uh, as architects in Indonesia. So I'll start a little bit about our background. Um, Laszlo and I, we met in Delft. Uh, while we were doing our post-grad studies at the Technical University there. He is from Hungary, and uh, as Sandra mentioned earlier, I was born in Jakarta. I spent the first uh, 11 years of my life there uh, before I moved to uh, Sydney. Um, and basically, uh, oops, sorry. After graduation, uh, we moved to London where he worked for Tony Fratton Architects, and I worked for uh, Grimshaw and later on for a longer duration for a small practice called um, Cottrell and Vermeulen Architecture. Uh, there we did projects such as these. Um, this is the British um, Embassy in Warsaw, uh, Poland, which Laszlo worked on. Next is a building called Solid 11 in Amsterdam which was uh, designed and engineered to last for 200 years. It was uh, designed together with Ove Arup. Uh, this is a um, uh, state school, which, was, uh, which is located in a predominantly Muslim part of Birmingham in the UK. And this is a, a clad school for a, a private school in the English countryside. So in 2012, we decided to set up uh, our practice, having spent the first year basically traveling to visit our families in Hungary, Australia, Indonesia, and, and also we traveled in, in Holland. Um, and what brought us to Jakarta was this small project uh, that you can see here. Um, it is. Uh, a refurbishment of a, a small house which we reconfigured internally and externally and you can see here um, that it's clad in the local uh, andesit stone and here are just a couple of images uh, of the facade um, and basically having having uh, finished this small project uh, the optimism typical of the Indonesian people sort of convinced us uh, to stay and do more um, but Having spent more time in the capital city of Jakarta, uh, we grew uh, semi-frustrated in a way because of the lack of uh, public spaces. So there were, uh, th there's a lack of uh, parks and social and cultural venues, which we were in a way accustomed to. 
um, basically a, a lot of uh, the things a lot of things happen inside the shopping mall the city is filled with the uh, shopping mall so you would do everything uh, you would uh, eat sometimes uh, study or, or um, see a concert everything in a shopping mall including watching a movie in multiplexes uh, showing predominantly Hollywood blockbusters so while searching for alternatives, we encountered uh, a non-profit organization uh, called Kina Forum, uh, which at the time, they were basically in a city of uh, over seven million people, they were the only cinema that uh, played uh, classical and uh, independent films. And our adventure sort of began there when we did this um, open air cinema uh, with them together in uh, 2013. Um, it was uh, a cinema, a temporary open air cinema designed for about 200 people uh, located in the CBD in uh, Monas, which is the National uh, Monument Park. And how we arrived to doing this project was, it was basically by a simple exchange of emails between two strangers, us and them. We didn't know them, they didn't know us. And we, uh, we wrote that we, um, we have an idea that could uh, promote their, their work. Uh, they were curious enough to meet us, so we met and that was it, uh, really. And we talked a lot about uh, the state of um, cinemas in the city the disappearance of uh, more traditional uh, and open air and, and independent cinemas being uh, replaced by uh, multiplexes in shopping malls. And basically what happened was that um, because there were only multiplexes left, it became quite uh, unaffordable for uh, people to, to see a movie. Uh, so I'll show you this image because it shows uh, the tradition uh, of having open air screenings in, in Indonesia, which practically disappeared uh, in around the 80s, uh, replaced by multiplexes. And what I'd like to show is that basically going to open air screenings like these, uh, it was not just about uh, the idea of seeing a movie, it was really about the sense of community, social gathering, speaking to the uh, people next to you, your neighbor, and very often, um, the street uh, in front of your house would be closed for a night or two, and the whole um, neighborhood would gather around to see a movie. So from the very beginning, um, we decided that uh, the cinema should be free for all. Um, it should be uh, uh, centrally located and unique enough so that uh, people of different types and different classes would, would come together. And it should also give them an experience of a proper cinema going experience. So the equipments that were used were professional state of the art uh, Dolby surround system, uh, projectors and, and so on. And um, it also had to be, um, uh, sorry, um, fast enough to be uh, assembled and reusable and recycled after. Um, and it also had to introduce the social side of, um, of cinema going. So this is uh, um, where it was uh, located. It's in the CBD uh, at the National Monument uh, Park. Oops. And basically, this was where it was uh, originally proposed, the location, but it was moved to the futsal area nearby. And this is a view of uh, of, of the city, uh, the CBD, adjacent to the park. So it, it was really, it's the most central location that one could, um, could uh, build cinema. And so we decided from very early on, we want to revive this uh, idea of the traditional uh, open air cinema. And we were inspired by them, and also we were inspired by uh, Lina Bobardi uh, and her work of the SEFE Pompeia, and also Achille uh, Casiglioni. Um, this is, uh, on the left, you have uh, a hanging shelf, which he designed in the 60s for uh, Bernini. And on the right, uh, you have the floss um, installation for the, for the lighting company. And you'll see the influence of that 
later in, in our initial design. So we wanted to create something light, uh, something fun, uh, and something very simple, and something very communal. And so this was uh, the proposed, the first uh, original proposed design. We designed uh, a space which is raised from the ground, uh, and you have the foyer to the left uh, with a canopy of light, uh, and you have the ticket booth and the bar separating the foyer from the, uh, from the cinema. So qu quite simple in design. Um, we decided to clad the, the volume in, in a semi-translucent material to give uh, volume to the space because it's located in a, in a large, vast open area and also to let it glow at night. Um, so for structure, because we need to assemble it very fast, we use scaffolding, um, typically used in construction. In Indonesia, this kind of scaffolding is widely available, but they were uh, mainly used in the oil and mining industry. Um, so it was the first time for the, for the company to, to do something like this. And for the cladding, we used um, agro, uh, agro net, which is a sort of netting commonly used in farming, um, allowing air, wind, and light to, to still pass through and we chose it because it's also a, a low cost uh, material. And this is the floor plan showing the staircase, oops, staircase going up uh, to the foyer area here. And then you have the ticket counter and the bar separating the cinema. And this is the section. So it is, uh, it is a very simple design. <coughs> this is the um, rendering showing the staircase going up to the foyer. Uh, uh, the foyer with the canopy of lights and the monument behind, and the cinema itself. And incidentally, um, uh, we realized later that, that our initial proposal actually resembled the traditional longhouses of um, Indonesia, which uh, are typically raised on stilts, uh, uh, having a long communal space uh, where different, fa uh, different families would, uh, would occupy. And luckily for us, um, the organizers of Jakarta Biennale saw our proposal, so uh, they helped us with the funding. And we actually uh, got the budget that uh, we hoped we would get, but we didn't realize that there would be all these cuts. There were all these different um, government taxes, and actually the, the end budget was quite a bit lower than what we hoped for. So. Basically, we had a week to redesign, um, and we also realized that the location was changed from the centrally paved area to the futsal area, and we woke up uh, realizing that we also had to be the main contractor because there was not enough money to hire a main contractor to coordinate the subcontractors. So um, this became the design. Uh, it became only one story high, the main spaces are still the same. You have the cinema on one side, the ticket booth and the bar, and the foyer. But we made it more open uh, because it's to be on the ground, uh, surrounded by futsal uh, fields. And the other uh, difference is we have this perimeter benches that goes around externally and internally. Uh, this is the uh, layout, which is still pretty much the same as the old one and this is uh, early under of the design. And now I'll introduce you to the subcontractor teams. So we had two subcontractors. Uh, the first, um, which you see here, are uh, the people who, um, who provided the scaffolding, whom we rented, uh, re we rented it from them, and who assembled the, um, the scaffolding. So as you can see, they're wearing hard hats, well, some of them anyway, and uh, work boots. So they were the more professional one. And behind here, you, you'll see uh, Mr. Herman. He is the other subcontractor. And this is his workshop. He, ma <laughs> he mainly uh, works in signage, but uh, he was willing to do this for us. It was his first time, and we, we trusted him. Um, so basically, this workshop that you're seeing here is about the size of a single car garage. And this is his other workshop. And 
obviously we were surprised when we first came there to, to check out the work, but they were, and, and I have to say that not, uh, not all workshops in Jakarta looks like this in this condition, but many, many are. And at the time, they were basically the only, uh, the only people who could match the figure that we had in our budget. So um, now I'll go through the uh, uh, construction photographs um, because I think that will really illustrate how, uh, how different things are, say, in Australia and the UK than uh, in comparison to Indonesia. So the basic design had scaffolding as its structure, plywood uh, cladding on top, and then came the fittings, which included the cushions, the um, uh, canopy of lights, the uh, screens, the projector, the tables, and the other loose furniture. And last uh, was the cladding, which was uh, made of uh, agronet. So here you can see the um, scaffolding uh, starting to go up with a little bit of the cladding. And next, uh, you can see these are uh, couplers that connects the pipes together and basically the plywood sits uh, on a little bit of hollow frame which then is tied down to the scaffolding. Um, these are the guys uh, going up to uh, connect the pipes together um, and as you can see there's no harness so every day they would climb up, um, this is about six meters high, and they would swing from module to module, um, trying to put all these things together, um, sometimes smoking away. Uh, and this is the view uh, from the top of the seating to the monument outside uh, before the cladding was put on, and this is after. Uh, this is the um, structure of the tiered seating. We made them quite deep, so you can either sit upright, uh, lean back, or sit cross-legged, uh, the traditional Indonesian way. Uh, this is a detail of the ticket booth, which would contain the, uh, the ticket counter, the cafe, and also the speakers. These are just some details of um, how the uh, structure and the cladding is put up together. Um, the signage, and this is how it looked like inside after it was done. And this is the uh, graphic that we did, um, which resembled the organization's uh, logo. These um, are the, uh, the panels being painted uh, at the workshop. And I just want to point out to the gate that you can see here. That's what the first thing that we saw when we arrived there. So, so we were a bit nervous, you know, whether they could actually do the job or not. But um, as, as you know, Indonesian people, they're, again, they're very optimistic and when we came there, they were all smiles, so we were more relaxed then, and uh, we knew that uh, they, could, they could do it, hopefully. Um, this, this was uh, on day five, so it was uh, halfway done. You can see that um, the ticket booth uh, is starting to, uh, to be put up uh, in the middle of a soccer match. Um, and next came the fittings, uh, the cushion, screens, projectors, uh, and the, the loose furniture. So uh, there was a technical um, advisor who advised us on the distance that one has to have um, between the projector and the screen and also the, the viewing angle. This was the screen being put up, uh, the speakers behind the screen, and this was how it looked uh, with the speakers inside before um, uh, felt rock wool material was uh, used. These were the canopy of lights. Uh, they were um, made out of thin uh, sheets of aluminum, which were cut and uh, folded. These were the lights uh, when it was being tested on site with the signage and on site in the foyer uh, in the evening. So it, it created this almost uh, studio uh, lighting uh, effect because it was quite even. Um, these were the tables that we designed, uh, inspired by Sol DeWitt. Um, <laughs> and these are the tables on site uh, with a view of the soccer match. And lastly came the cladding, uh, which was made by uh, Acronet. So these are our detailed drawings that we, um, we provided. Uh, and basically, 
they were treated as curtains, so there was a steel wire um, which uh, go, went through the, the curtain and they were tied to the scaffolding on top and at the bottom in between the uh, benches. And these uh, were the curtains being put up before they were stretched. And these are the guys uh, climbing, again, climbing up with that harness, uh, stretching them up. And he was smoking, you know, some multitasking in nation way. Um, these were the curtains after they were completed, stretched during the day, and it was nice that you could see the silhouettes of the scaffolding structure in the evening uh, with two guys sitting on the benches. Uh, and lastly came the signage. Uh, these, uh, this is the signage being made at Mr. Herman's workshop, uh, the signage on site, and basically within 10 days, uh, it was all done. Uh, there was only one thing left, and that was to uh, get a pawang hujan. A pawang hujan is uh, a rain shaman, uh, uh, loosely translated. And to our surprise, uh, the majority of Indonesians believe that they can do their magic and uh, perform their things uh, um, at a given event, at a particular location and basically stop the rain from happening. So uh, places like golf courses would regularly, regularly use their service and uh, important um, events such as wedding and, uh, and government uh, ceremony. So we, there was actually a budget allocated uh, for Pawang uh, Hujan or a rain shaman, uh, at least for the opening night. And believe it or not, it did not rain a single drop uh, that night. So. <laughs> um, so here it is, uh, the view of the front, shall we say, uh, of the entrance area in the evening. Um, you see this word misbar, and it's short for grimis bubar, which in Indonesian translate as uh, drizzle disperse. So basically with the traditional open air cinema, when it drizzled, um, people would just run and, and disperse. So, so we adopted the, the name as well. This is the view um, of it during the day um, from the base of the monument. Uh, the view of its uh, rear during a soccer match and uh, you can see that it almost looked like the tiered sitting uh, was, was floating. Uh, and basically when during the day when the cinema wasn't uh, going, uh, the whole space would still be open. The only thing that was closed was the, um, the ticket counter, which had the steeped doors which would uh, shut. So you get kids and, and um, adults sitting on the table, uh, playing there and, and so on. And this is the view of uh, the cinema area at night with uh, the monument behind and the foyer area. And you can see some raincoats here. So besides the cinema being free, we also uh, gave away free raincoats, which the kids absolutely love. So even though it wasn't raining, they would, they would just wear their, their raincoat. And so despite the name, Drizzle Disperse, uh, when it rains, uh, the people would still stay there. They would either take out their raincoat or um, take, uh, take out their um, umbrellas. This is the foyer again uh, during a soccer match, views of the foyer in the evening, um, the crowds inside and the crowds outside. So most often um, it would be quite crowded inside and you'd see crowds gathering outside. And I wanted to show this image because you can see this man here, he's the local garbage collector trying to catch a, gl a glimpse of the movie. And at the, I think it was the last night uh, before opening night, we, a group of us, we were telling old ladies uh, around the area selling food on the street um, to come to the event and to bring their families uh, to watch uh, free movies throughout the, throughout the event. And, and they simply couldn't believe it. Uh, they couldn't believe that it would be free, that something like this built in, in the park for the first time would be completely free. And, 
the only way we could convince them was we had to bring out the program booklet that actually had the word free. Um, and you know, they were all smiles afterwards. And, and yeah, just because of things like that, it, it sort of made, it made things, yeah, it was really worth, uh, worth the effort. And because of that, because a lot of people didn't believe that it was free, the organization decided to put this banner, um, which basically said that the whole entire event uh, is free. This is the view again of the back with the soccer players, uh, the players uh, using the bench, again the foyer, and uh, uh, the, uh, the foyer area from one of the openings. And basically, uh, with this project, uh, from the beginning what I forgot to mention is that we didn't need any permits. Uh, we didn't have to get any, any building permits at all. Um, the only thing we had to get was a letter from the governor. And also we were asked by the Jakarta Board of Tourism and Culture who funded the entire project, a letter from the structural engineer uh, that states that the structure has been calculated and that, is, that it is safe and sound. Bas and basically we found out later that the whole reason for that letter is because the then governor, who is now the uh, president of Indonesia, was going to come <laughs> to come to the opening. So, <laughs> So yeah, so we 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 were very grateful that we get to do this uh, project, um, and from this quite a small project, and it's 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 not it wasn't a big uh, architectural project. It was a temporary uh, building, but because of it, we got invited to uh, places like Chicago and Germany, and and now here tonight. So you never know. <laughs> the next project. Um, was uh, invited competition by the British Council. Um, it was uh, for, we had to create a space that would exhibit a few photographs and also uh, display a live photo shoot during uh, Jakarta Fashion Week. Um, and this was our uh, proposal, very simple. We used tubular um, steel pipes uh, to sort of hang the exhibits and aluminum foil emergency blanket as, as curtains to, to partially close off the photo shoot area. So we were selected, but uh, I think about three weeks before it was supposed to be completed, during a meeting, someone somehow realized that they gave us the wrong dimension and uh, Basically, this, uh, the space that we had was only about a fraction of, of what we designed. And so we had to, again, redesign within, I think, four days. And we started to realize that this, this was a recurring thing, you know, working in Indonesia. There would always be last minute surprises and we would just have to improvise. So the final pro proposal became this, which was a lot smaller and, and more simple, but still retaining the same sort of material and just have a couple of images to show. And so the next project, um, Menteng, is a project that uh, we are initiating. It's for a cinema, uh, cafe, and um, outdoor exhibition space to uh, located in a disused car park in Jakarta. So here is, uh, a rendering of it, um, and we thought it would be a good opportunity to use um, a, sort of a, an existing public facility that, that isn't used uh, for a social or cultural activity. So there is the cinema here, a cafe underneath, and surrounding it is an outdoor um, art installation uh, space. And the idea was to get the quite interactive um, uh, art installations that would uh, that could be enjoyed by both kids and, and adults. This is the the site. This is the rooftop of the car park, which is uh, not open to the public, so it's not used. It's a split split level structure. This is the view uh, from the top of the car park. So as you can see, it's. It, it's quite nice, it's, you have the greeneries and then you have the city skyline. So 
we've been um, we've been talking to organizations such as um, British Council, uh, Japan Foundation, and also the Ministry of uh, Youth and Recreation, um, who supports the idea and are willing to help in providing programs and content to the project. So hopefully we'll we'll get it going. Um, the architectural idea uh, basically derives from the split level. So we have oops, the cinema, uh, which rises up from the higher level of the, um, of the split level uh, slabs, which uh, gave enough space underneath uh, for a cafe to be accommodated. So we have this form rising up, which is almost like this hovering mysterious object inviting people down below to come up. This is the suction. So as you can see, it's, it's, it's quite simple in design. This is, again, the similar view that I showed earlier. The cafe underneath and the cinema. And we intended it to also function, say, as a lecture venue or a concert or a play. This is the view uh, of the cafe overlooking the city and the skyline. And this is how one would look up from below. So hopefully, through uh, perseverance and time, we could we could uh, get it happen. Uh, the next project is a small project that we did uh, at the end of last year. It was uh, for the state film company. They asked us to think of an idea of a very um, low cost uh, indoor cinema to be used in villages and um, regional towns within Indonesia. So what we came up with were these um, indiv individual fabrics, uh, with curved fabrics which looked almost like an over and large um, curtains uh, made out of felt rock wool to in enclose, semi-enclose the cinema that you can see here from the, from the outside uh, area. That, and it also acts as a uh, sort of, sorry, acoustic, uh, uh, yeah, fabric. Um, and inside, it's, again, it's quite simple. You have a ply uh, screen uh, panel, space for the projector and loose seatings. And this is the outside, just a simple table. And the idea is that they could just use their um, existing furniture if they have it. And we have some panels to show the um, film programs and the, and the community um, notices. Uh, the next is, uh, the next project, Chideng, is, is the first office project that uh, we are working on, also in Jakarta. Um, it is to go on site this September. It's, um, it's to be the head, uh, headquarter office of a plastic manufacturing company in Jakarta eight stories high, so it will have things like a cafe, a showroom, canteen function room, function room typical office spaces, and, and also a top floor executive suite for its owner with a rooftop garden. And this is, um, this is the site here. So they occupy uh, two plots next to this tower being constructed. And the whole reason that they, want, they needed a new building was because when this tower uh, was uh, excavated, they didn't do it properly. You'll, you'll hear that often sometimes, I think, in Jakarta. And so the neighboring building started to slide, and it created um, huge cracks on the floor, uh, in the walls, and some of the slabs were, were basically sloping. So they needed a new building, and thankfully, they chose us. Um, so. This is our initial idea. Um, basically, with the, their original building, it was completely built uh, fully within the site. And the front sort of mandatory setback area was used for parking. And this is very typical for office building of this scale in, uh, in Indonesia. So we convinced um, the, the client to build in a smaller foot plate, but higher, so they could have some outdoor uh, garden at the front and at the back, free of parking. Uh, this is the ground floor plan. Uh, show, this is the street here, showing the drop-off area and the entrance. So this whole floor is to be 
the reception cafe and uh, showroom area overlooking the back garden. Oh, sorry. Um, and above that would be the meeting rooms and their sort of canteen uh, function room with an outdoor terrace. So the first three floors um, are the, were the uh, semi-public spaces. This is a view showing, sorry, showing the drop-off area uh, from to the basement and the entrance. And this is the view of the entrance area under the building canopy. This is the typical floor. So what we've done is we push the core to one side of the building with three openings so that the uh, typical office area could be subdivided into three areas quite easily. This is the exact executive uh, top floor suite. There's the meeting room, reception, and an office suite complete with a dressing area and, and the bathroom. And it's to be surrounded by tropical uh, plants uh, in a pavilion roof garden sort of setting. This is a, a view of it. And to decide on the facade, we did a whole series of sun studies uh, in different times during the day and in different months. Um, and <coughs> that's basically to decide, you know, say what is the, what the depth of the column should be, how frequent it should be, and what type of sun sh shading it should have. And this is, um, this is in development and this is most likely where it's heading towards. So it's a more uh, solid, stone-clad solid facade with canopies in the front and more fre frequent columns on the side. And again, this is sort of going against the typical office building um, which in Jakarta, which predominantly use quite thin uh, glass curtain walls. This is the sun study of the internal areas. And initially, we wanted to use uh, ceramic tiles as the cladding material, uh, which was common in older office buildings in Jakarta. This is one of my favorite buildings uh, in central Jakarta by uh, Paul Rudolph. Uh, which was completely, which is completely clad in ceramic tiles, uh, which is actually a great material because it's very durable and suits the monsoon season of, of Indonesia. Unfortunately, though, the client favors more stone facade, so that's, yeah, we'll use stone facade um, of basically local andesite and, and granite. Um, the next project is a small apartment that we recently completed. Uh, it's a three-bedroom apartment, and we were, oops, we were asked to design all the joineries and pretty much all the furniture. Um, so you can see here, this is the kitchen, and the kitchen overlooking the, uh, sorry, living room, and here is the living room, and this is, uh, we, we don't have so much photographs yet because it was recently done. This basically hides the storage and a folding bed uh, behind. This is a table we designed. And I wanted to show this project um, because uh, in, in Jakarta, there are a lot of workshops. There are a lot of carpenters, so you could um, easily get a prototype done in, in, in a very uh, affordable way. So for this project, we did a lot of one-to-one -one mock ups uh, We did one-to-one -one mock ups of uh, door details and, and also of the joinery details. So the furniture is still uh, an ongoing, uh, it's still ongoing. Uh, the last project I'll show you, it's uh, a house that we, uh, we're designing. Uh, it's also, uh, it will also go on site this year. It's a house for a, uh, a family uh, who wants a lot of outdoor space, which is not quite common in, in Jakarta. And it's, this is the site that you can see here. Uh, it's 600 square meters. Um, and the reason why I want to show you this photograph is I wanted to show the neighboring buildings. And again, stress that um, in Jakarta and in Indonesia, a lot of the the houses are fully built in terms of width and, and sometimes the length as well towards the back. And what an interesting thing that uh, we found while designing houses was that the, for middle and upper class households, uh, they would often have a, a, a group of staff 
this would consist of, say, housemates, uh, nannies, sometimes a cook or a chauffeur, and they would actually live together with the family within the same house. So privacy is always an issue, and very often um, what happens is uh, you would have, the architect would have to create a, a separate compound within the house um, that would contain um, their living spaces, so the maid's living spaces, say, say the bedrooms, uh, the kitchen, the living areas, and the bathroom. So uh, what we did was uh, we designed a three-story uh, building, uh, a pedestal with two stories of the main volume um, above. The width of the volume does not, it's, it's only I think about half of the site, but because it is flanked by these two um, larger, more grand houses, we, we use very, very deep cantilevers um, to sort of ba balances the volume, but it also dealt with uh, the issues of heat and, and rain. Um, this is a view of the house from the side. You can see uh, there's a pitch roof pier, and the whole reason because of uh, is that in Jakarta, you could not submit a DA for a, for a house without it having a pitch roof. A flat roof house would, would, not be, uh, would not be approved, basically. So we had to have a pitch roof. It dealt with heat, but at the same time, we, we, made, it, uh, we made a gentle slope so you won't actually see, see it from uh, below. Uh, so this, is, this was an early working model that we did um, that showed the ground floor. There is a front yard and a backyard. The services compound are all to the side of the house, uh, including the circulation. This is the garage, the workshop, a guest bedroom, and this area now is now completely open. It becomes the guest uh, living room. This is the raised uh, living area, so you have the kitchen, the uh, dining room and the living room with a pool, green area, and you have the services here and the circu circulation core. Uh, the top floor consists of the bedrooms, the master bedroom, a rumpus room, and two bedrooms here. Again, the services are to the side with the circulation, and you see that the balconies are quite deep. In the rumpus room area, it goes from here to here, and this is, I think, about 2.75 meters, let's say. And then this is the roof, uh, which mainly contains the plant area and a laundry area. This is a early render of the uh, front facade of the building. is to be clad in white travertine. Uh, and you can see how we, t we try to deal with the Indonesian climate most of the time uh, in, a, in a very simple way, rather than using complex engineering. So through the articulation of the facade with its openable facade and cross uh, circulation, and also with the deep uh, cantilever, cantilevers to deal with heat and, and rain. So the ground floor, the main floor finishes would, would be local andesite uh, and terrazzo. And on the first floor, travertine and terrazzo, and on the top, travertine and uh, timber. This is a view from the back of the house, looking to the street with the pool. Um, this is the rare side of the, the house with the uh, garden on the ground floor. And these are just a couple of uh, interior renders of the rumpus room uh, adjacent to the bedrooms. and. Uh, dining room and the kitchen uh, overlooking uh, the pool. So that's the last uh, project uh, I'll show. Um, and I'll just do a bit of conclusion. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't easy for us uh, at the beginning uh, when we arrived to Jakarta. You know, it was a new place, new people, new ways of working. And I remember at the beginning, uh, we met quite a few people who asked us to design neoclassical homes, you know, or, or what they call as uh, American classic, which is basically when 
you have husband and wife uh, who couldn't decide whether they wanted a modern looking house or a more classical Renaissance looking house. And we would, you know, obviously uh, politely uh, turn them down. And, and we found that in Indonesia, houses uh, that are being built, they are quite um, stylistically very diverse. So often you, you get an architect who would work on, on these uh, different styles. And, <coughs> and another big difference we found that in terms of construction, compared to say Australia and the UK, things are less contractual. So that with the fact that labor is, is quite cheap, the low cost of lab labor, you can change the design during construction in a more uh, simpler and less uh, formal manner between say architects and contractor. Um, I hope that you could see that uh, our approach when we work on sort of low cost projects such as the cinema or a more higher end uh, budget project like the office or this house is pretty much, uh, it's pretty much the same. Um, we, we spend a lot of times actually drawing details and, and thinking about them. And we found that uh, we, go, we go to site more frequently than one would do say in Australia and the UK. And the reason being uh, is because uh, many of the construction workers, they are not formally trained. So we would often uh, draw on the walls on site and we would bring models, whether it's a 3D model in the computer or, or a cardboard mock-up to sort of show them how things work and what we intend to do. And, <coughs> and at times, of course, uh, they can occasionally test our patience. Um, but I think we've grown more more calm and patient when uh, something goes wrong um, on site. And it's actually quite pleasant dealing with people uh, because Indonesians are not so, uh, they're not so con confrontational. So instead of uh, saying no, they would say to my partner, it's okay, it's okay, mister, we try, we try, you know, which is, which is quite nice and, and actually, at the end of the, the project, um, we get to know some of them quite well. And, and this enables the architect as the designer to, to um, develop quite a close relationship with the people on site who are actually um, building the buildings, uh, which, is, which is quite nice. And so, um, yeah, so, so far at the moment, we've been very lucky in the sense that we get to do a variety of projects. Um, the house that you see here, it will also go on site this year. Hopefully we can continue uh, doing that. And we hope that uh, we could do more public projects, whether they are temporary or permanent. And Jakarta has, you know, in its way, it's, it's changing and it has grown on us quite a bit and we hope we could uh, contribute something better to the city. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Melissa. I'd like to welcome Sylvia McKelly to the stage. Sylvia is a UQ academic and she is our uh, panelist questioner um, today for the Q&A session. So thank you. Well, thank you, Melissa, for uh, coming to Brisbane mm -hmm. and Pleasure. giving this very insightful mm -hmm. lecture tonight. So I will start uh, from the Kinge Forum, which mm -hmm. is uh, a very interesting project and uh, also from your consideration about the lack of public space in Jakarta. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that that building really uh, is a cinema, but at the same time is a generator of public space, mm -hmm. I mean, it's also a soccer field, yeah. it's also a gathering point. Mm -hmm. And I see that you really are king in the production of public space. So what is mm -hmm. your plan? Or what, how can you contribute to uh, the production of public space in Jakarta, especially taking into account that Jakarta is changing, so yes. probably there will be more mm -hmm. opportunities. Um, we actually, the current governor of Jakarta, um, he has a program and he, he realizes that cinema going has become 
unaffordable for uh, the majority of people, as I mentioned before. And what he uh, is planning to do is to convert a lot of the market halls uh, within the city and to transpo transform part of the uh, space uh, inside as cinemas during the evening. So hopefully uh, we, could, uh, we could contribute to that. And what he has done is he's been uh, uh, developing a lot of um, uh, green spaces <coughs> in cooperation with uh, companies, uh, private companies actually through corporate social responsibility. Which, which is great. And the reason why he actually did that is because the bureaucracy of government funding, so which we sort of experience with the, with the Kinoform project. That's why with um, the other cinema that uh, we are working on, the, the red structure, we are trying to get private funding and sort of gather enough capital and so that year by year, we can, we can be self-funded and so hopefully we'll get that realized and we can um, show more ideas uh, of, of public spaces, yeah. <coughs> and uh, do you feel that the government and the authorities are mm -hmm. supportive of uh, architecture as a means of uh, changing mm -hmm. the, uh, the making of the cities and Indonesian cities? Yeah. I think now they are. Uh, it's election time, so I hope they'll they'll get reelected. But when when we first came, um, I'm not sure if that was the case. Uh, you there from a lot of people that we spoke to, especially in the arts uh, and design field. Um, often when they they were offered a, sort of a government project, uh, they would say no. And the reason why was because of the, again, the bureaucracy. It, often it was very last minute and in terms of funding and also the program. But we didn't know it at the time. No one knew. <laughs> so we just, you know, we just dived in and, 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 and we did it, yeah. So, um, so it, is, it is changing, yeah. Mm. And how did you uh, did it? I mm -hmm. mean, how did you deal with this uh, heavily bureaucratized you know, regime and uh, <coughs> um, how are you doing now um, in terms of practice? In terms of practice. We, we tried to, um, when it came to, let's say, the meetings with uh, sort of the government uh, departments uh, and things like that, we tried to sort of almost stay behind the picture as much as we can. So let's say with the cinema, we were working with this org uh, nonprofit organization um, called Kina Forum, which was under the Jakarta Arts Institute. So from the beginning almost, we said to them, okay, when it comes to uh, permits and things like that, uh, you, guys have to <laughs> you guys have to deal with it. Uh, so that's, yeah, that's usually how we, how we did it. Obviously, um, we still have to meet and, and uh, comply with certain things, but it, it is really, really changing and it's becoming um, less, less bureaucratic. Uh, probably the last minute aspects uh, might still be there. So we, I, I think our strategy is basically to know what to expect, to know that there will be surprises somehow and there would be, you know, we just have to improvise, yeah. <coughs> so, um, by showing Castiglioni and Lina Bobardi, mm -hmm. I understand that uh, your approach of, to architecture is uh, holistic. I mean, mm -hmm. you like working at different scales from the urban level down to the production of uh, mm -hmm. details. So here is the question. Uh, in, a prof in a profession where speci specialization counts more and more, yep. how do you promote your design method, which appears to work uh, at various scales? Mm -hmm. um, where uh, we worked before in our previous practice, um, we basically did uh, both the architecture and the interior and often the furniture itself. So we were quite used to that way of working. Um, I also, when I was studying at UTS in Sydney, I did a sub major in furniture design. So I was always interested in, in, in making furniture. So I think, and, and also I think because the clients that we have now, um, they ask 
they tend to ask us to uh, design both the architecture and interior, so it, it, it is quite seamless um, and almost. So we, are, we quite enjoy doing that from the large scale to the small scale. So let's move on and uh, talk about uh, tropical architecture. Mm -hmm. So I've seen that you have been invited to this exhibition, Tropicality <coughs> Revised, in yeah. Frankfurt. Uh, and more and more, Southeast Asian architecture is uh, of interest uh, in uh, other parts of the world, mm -hmm. in the United States and also um, in Europe, with totally different climatic uh, yeah. conditions. So what do you think is the appealing factor of tropical architecture at the moment in those areas? Um. I think they, they're starting to see um, that it's shifting uh, the sort of the architecture being built from, from this idea of, uh, you know, semi-traditional tropical architecture. Say, uh, probably a decade ago, when, when you think of Indonesian architecture, you, you s the image that you would get are these tropical Balinese-style uh, uh, buildings. And I think now the outside world is starting to see that there, there is something different, something more urban, uh, a, a more urban architecture, which has always uh, been there since a long time ago, but um, it was just not, I guess, well publicized sort of thing. So um, I think that's where the, maybe the renewed interests uh, are coming from. And also, if you think of Asian architecture, uh, predomin predominantly you would think of Japan, South Korea, uh, China, and, and maybe Vietnam. And you wouldn't, you wouldn't really think of, say, Indonesia or, or Malaysia or Cambodia or maybe India in exception to, say, Studio Mumbai. So I think they, they want to know more uh, about it, which is good, yeah. So, and in terms of uh, uh, Indonesia and uh, mm -hmm. perhaps uh, Jakarta, it seems to me that there is room for experimentation and possibilities. Mm -hmm. So, um, you have decided to stay in Jakarta, and despite the fact that you have to improvise and deal yeah. with uh, enormous differences, you are enjoying walking there. Mm -hmm. So, can you tell us a bit more about this uh, city and this nation from an architectural point of view and what it can offer to? Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe even uh, foreign <coughs> offices working there. Uh, yep, uh, I think uh, Jakarta, where we are based currently, is is quite a chaotic city. So you have, um, unlike say the neighboring uh, countries like Singapore, which is you know it's very organized and, and quite Western like. Jakarta is very different. You have. Obviously, when you go to the city center, there are all these uh, skyscrapers designed by um, uh, international architects. But you step out of these quite Western, quite modern facilities, uh, just by a few meters, you've got these little, um, little houses, which some are legal, some are illegal, and, and it's a totally different world. Um, so you always have this juxtaposition which, which we really enjoy. Um, and the cities are, are changing dramatically um, in terms of infrastructure and design. And, and it's, yeah, it is quite, uh, it's quite interesting to be, to be part of that, yeah. So it seems to me that in Jakarta at the moment there is this discrepancy between very, being very global and, the, and being very local. Yeah. So how is it, the negotiation of these two levels and uh, what kind of identity Jakarta is developing? Oh, hard question. <laughs> um, I think now um, the, the people are uh, more um, educated in terms of design. Um, they're a lot more people being aware of, um, say, arts and architecture from abroad. Predominantly, I think, personally, that it's, in terms of outside uh, architecture, it's mainly coming from America, Singapore, and, and places like Singapore. Um, a little bit of Europe, predominantly from Holland, historically as well, Indonesia was colonized by the Dutch, and I think not so much from the from the rest of Europe, 
which I think is why it was quite hard, I think, for us as well at the beginning when we, when we started out, because they look at the, the projects that we, we have done and they think, wow, it, it, it is so foreign, you know? And, but, but it is changing and there are a lot more discussions uh, set up by the, the government with uh, local practices to, to try to, to, talk about, to talk about this, yeah. And what are the venues where you meet, you know, your colleagues and uh, the government and discuss about uh, issues of public uh, interest mm -hmm. in um, Jakarta? There is this, uh, there is a architecture biennale uh, that takes place in Jakarta, I think every three, three years. So it's still, it's still not that often. So we don't really have um, big forums like what you guys, you guys have here. But uh, the government has, uh, they've also set up uh, an independent body called the, I think, the, the Department of Creative Economy, which encompasses all the design fields. And they act almost as a sort of middle person between the government and, and the independent, say, designers, and try to gauge what is uh, needed and and what uh, they hope to do. Um, and that's been going on, I think, for a couple of years, which is quite good, because from that, they, they initiated quite a lot of projects, yeah. And what are your <coughs> plans for the future? Uh, our plans for the future, um, we'll still stay in Jakarta, at least for the time being. Um, it's not a hard, uh, it's, it's, it's not an easy city to, to live, but hopefully, yeah, hopefully we can, we can do more public projects and, and just sort of show a, a different type of architecture or a different way of dealing with the local traditions and, and local surroundings, yeah. And mentioning a local tradition, what is your knowledge of local tradition and your interest in mm -hmm. trying to you know, convert uh, or learn from local tradition and convert it into contemporary uh, terms? Mm -hmm. um, I, I spent the first 11 years of my life in Indonesia and I would still, um, during my uh, school years here, I would still go back there about once a year. So it's still very much in my mind and actually I, I studied Indonesian literature as well when I was here. So it's, um, we, we always, with almost every project that we do, we looked at the uh, precedents historically. So with the cinema, that's what we did. And with houses, that's what we did. Um, because for my partner, everything in Indonesia is, is quite new. He spent most of his life in Europe and I've been away for some time, so it's also, uh, trying to understand and look at its progression with, uh, yeah, with, with an open mind. And what we try to do is, we try to make things in a, in a simple way. So in Indonesia, there are lots of workshops that, that make things, but in the majority, uh, they are still quite traditional in terms of equipment or ways of working. So, um, often we would have a design and we would talk to them whether it's, uh, it's possible to be built in this way or not and whether the detail would, would work out in this manner with, and whether they can do it. And, and it's sort of like a compromise uh, sort of process with what we want to do and what, what they can do. So that's, that's also a common, common thing um, that happens and I guess it's a way of us trying to understand uh, the, the way of making things traditionally, yeah. So moving on on another um, issue of the profession is uh, mm -hmm. um, this, um, this talk series is very much focused on bringing out uh, the, <coughs> the role of uh, women in the architecture realm. Yep. So we already spoke about that in a previous conversation, but how, how is it working in Indonesia and in Jakarta as a female architect? Mm -hmm. Uh, I think they are more tolerant, say, than in the West. Uh, I surprisingly. Think, yes, yeah. surprisingly. So um, I think the, say, 
during the construction process, the contractors, they are, I don't know, maybe they are, they are less manly or they are less aggressive, but maybe it comes down to the Indonesian or the Japanese people being not so confrontational as well. And they are more, um, they are more casual about things. So I remember the first year when we came to Jakarta, um, we set up our practice when, when I had uh, my first daughter and she's been on site. <laughs> you know, I used to carry her and uh, sometimes only one or two times we would go on site and, and they would actually be, be fine with it. So they're, they're very accommodating uh, in that way. So, um, so I think, yeah, in, in, in a sense, it's, it's a bit, it's a bit uh, better. And there is this tradition in an Indonesian family, um, you're very close to your parent. So uh, very often the parents would, uh, uh, would look after or babysit your kids. And I think that's, that's why I've met a lot of, uh, in a way, women architects, because they get that family support that uh, then they can, they can continue work um, after sort of giving birth and having a family. And also, plus, I think the um, maternity holiday, I think it's only about like three months or something. So you have no choice, really, in a way, financially, uh, to, for, for some families to, to actually go back, go back to work. So, so yeah, so there are pros and cons, but I think it, it, it's quite accommodating, yeah, in a way. So thank you so much. I think we have run out of time. <coughs> And join me in thanking again Melissa. Thank you both of you. It was really a fascinating conversation. So before we finish tonight, I've been given the important duty of announcing the first Archive Spy winner of the year. Which is this lovely little image here. I don't know what it is or where it is. Does anybody recognise it? It's not local. It's in Singapore? Is that a guess or is that a...? <laughs> so to our, our winner, we will be in touch. The library staff will be in touch. We don't know if this is the person's name or initials, so I won't even attempt it, but <laughs> there they are, they're the winner. Um, next week, so there's still a little bit more of APAF to go. Um, make sure that if you haven't booked for tomorrow night that you get along. Um, get onto the website and see what else there is uh, remaining. There's lots of events. Um, next week we have Jeremy, Jeremy <coughs> McLeod and it's going to be a really, really great discussion. So jump onto the Design Online website and register. The tickets are now available for the next two uh, lectures in the series. So thank you and have a good evening and thanks again to Melissa and Sylvia. Thank you.